This is episode number four with Erin Weideman. Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hi, I'm your host, Michelle Lamoureux. If you feel like you're being called to do more with your life and are looking for some inspiration, then you're going to love today's interview. Erin Weideman is the founder and CEO of Bible Bells, and she's an award-winning author of the Adventures of Rooney Cruz series. Erin is committed to changing the world's current definition of beauty. As a certified teacher, coach, and nationally recognized speaker, she offers speaking, workshops, and seminars to equip women of all ages to let go of fear and step into the unique leadership roles for which they were designed. Erin is a five-time cancer survivor, and she lives in San Diego with her husband and daughter. Erin is also the host of the Heroes for Her podcast, where she interviews celebrities, actors, musicians, and other women who are living out their passions in line with their personal values. When I first heard of Erin's story, I knew I wanted to have her on the show. She shares such wisdom in this episode, and it's so inspiring to hear how she is living her true calling. If you know of somebody going through a transition or needs a story of hope and faith, then please do share this episode. I look forward to introducing you to Erin. So let's dive on into the interview. Hey, Erin, welcome to the show. Hey, Michelle. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so thrilled to have you on today, Erin. Your story is so remarkable and inspiring, and I can't wait to dig in. So I thought we could start it with sharing a little bit about how you got started uh, professionally and how your journey went from working in finance to becoming a teacher to becoming a children's book bestselling author in a very niche space. Yeah, I would love to. So I started off, you know, I grew up in Orange County, got a softball scholarship to play at Penn State, so moved all the way across the country and majored in my two favorite subjects, journalism and Spanish. I was always a writer and a language person, a communicator, but I was so, so lost in terms of my identity and my giftings and what I was put on the earth to do that when I graduated from college, I went into finance. I worked for a mortgage company um, in California right during the housing boom of 2006, 2007, right before the market crashed. And, you know, made a ton of money. And I thought if I can be this strong, successful career woman and buy a house by the time I'm 25, that is going to really be impressive. So that was my goal for two years. And I just put my head down and grinded and toiled and worked, you know, tons of hours and bought that house and then moved in, in the, at the beginning of 2007. And just a few months later, I moved right back out of that house and in with my parents because I was diagnosed with metastasized aggressive thyroid cancer that had spread from my neck all the way up both sides of my, you know, both sides of my neck into my chest and into my brain. And from there, I just, I just, you know, started treatment and started digging and looking inside myself going, gosh, I am wasting all of my giftings and I'm wasting what I was put here to do. So I felt a call into teaching right around that time, 2007, got into a teaching program and spent the last, you know, 10 or so years teaching kids in the classroom and just working with them. And that's kind of how we fast forwarded all the way to the business. And now I've since quit teaching and I'm traveling now all around the country speaking and, and teaching workshops and talking to parents and doing a lot of things to champion the next generation of girls. So I've really been on a very interesting, tumultuous journey, but it's such an honor to be able to now really have stepped into my calling and I'm using everything that is, is inside me to, to bless the world and to, to make a positive impact, my positive impact on the world. And so beautiful, Erin. I, I just remember the first time you actually shared your story with me about having cancer. Um, you're actually a five-time cancer survivor, right? Yes. Uh, 
I just taking a breath on that. I mean, I, if you don't mind just sharing. Um, so going back to when you were in finance, moving in with your family, with your parents, because you realize you have cancer and just taking us on that journey and going a little bit deeper into what you were experiencing at that time and how that really just shifted your awareness about life and, you know, your purpose here and, um, wanting to put, you know, all your heart into what you felt like was, why are you, why are you on the, why are you on this planet and how that's evolved a bit but if you could get into the story yeah definitely so i mean right after my first diagnosis i mean like so i ended up in the doctor's office my mom just in passing had said cuz i had felt a lump you know in college in the, the side of my neck just like the size of the tip of your finger and thought you know what's that so i had it checked by a doctor and they said you don't have any symptoms you know you're a healthy athlete we'll just watch it and like a responsible you know young 20 something i totally forgot about it which is what we do mm-hmm. and then fast forward to you know i'm 25 my mom just says hey did you ever get that checked out again and i say no and she says let's go to the doctor so we go to the doctor together the doctor gave me a real quick exam and he knew right. I mean, sitting face to face across from me that it was cancer. He thought it might've been like lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease. And he said that to me in the doctor's office. And so right away I knew something was wrong, but I still, you know, I hadn't had any experience being an emotional person. I had always, you know, felt very guarded about my emotions. I I would always say I never was a sharer. I I never, I really struggled in my relationship. So at the beginning of my diagnosis, I just tried to handle everything on my own. I thought I've got to be strong. I'm self-sufficient. I'm independent. I'm just going to put my head down and do, you know, what an athlete would do. And I can just persevere on my own. And I tried, I tried so hard for a couple of months and I ended up having to do a 72 hour treatment called radioactive iodine, where you take a pill of radiation and they lock you in a room for three days and you can't come out because your entire body starts like radiate outward as the medicine's working. And I'm in that room and there's no one there with me. And I got so dizzy that I thought I was going to faint. So I laid down, I was, I did it in my parents' bathroom. Um, and because they had an attached bathroom to their bedroom. So I'm in there, I put my face against the tile in my parents' bathroom and I just prayed. I, I just prayed. And I, I got so sick and so scared. And I think, you know, half because I was so physically sick and half because I just realized at that moment how much time I had wasted mm. caring so much about, you know, trying to get things for myself that didn't matter and not really living into my giftings and what I was called to do that I got out of that room and thought, okay, I'm going to die. Like our, my prognosis is not good. We didn't catch the cancer early. Like the doctors were not hopeful for me. Um, but I thought what's the quickest way I can step into what I feel like God's placed on my heart to do. And for me, I just felt like a wrenching in my spirit about children, about this next generation, what they need, you know, what they need to hear, how they need to be encouraged, how they need to be equipped. And I thought this is something I can get excited about doing. And if I spend every single day to the day I die, pouring wisdom and support and understanding and love into children, what a blessing that can be for, for them and for the next generation and ultimately the world. But what a great way for me to tap into what God's placed inside me so that I can go do the work he wants me to do. Wow. That's so amazing. And it's, you know, what's so beautiful about it too, is that you're writing the books, which we'll get into in a bit more now, um, it was really just a continuum of really wanting to support children. So that's clearly what's been in your heart to do. And it's been an evolution of that gift that was planted in you. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I got into the classroom and very quickly realized that my heart was breaking for the next generation of girls specifically, what they are going through in terms of their friendships not understanding who they are, that they're constantly comparing themselves to everybody they see, and they don't have the equipment, the skills, and the internal character to really understand who they are and step into their roles as leaders out into the world. Because that that's the fact that, that faces us. How do we come alongside girls and help strengthen their character in such a way that they would grow up feeling confident, 
and bold and excited and equipped and ready and prepared to do the work that is inside them to do. So that's what gets me really excited. And the more I worked with kids, the more I was like, I mean, mentoring sixth grade girls and hearing about everything they're dealing with going, gosh, is there something we can do years before a a girl would ever walk through the door of a middle school that we could equip her in such a way that she would be able to understand her true identity and not suffer all of the challenges and different hurdles of middle school, high school, and young adulthood because we've equipped her ahead of time. And that was exciting to me. That's amazing. So basically you then took that passion and where did the concept or this sort of desire to then translate that into the books originate? Yeah. So my husband and I were, you know, on the way home from church one Sunday morning and we were debating what to get our sweet little niece, Hannah, for her birthday. And she was turning six and starting kindergarten. And we thought, gosh, she's, she's about to enter kindergarten and face all of these challenges, whether it's bullying or friendships, you know, a lot of girls show up at school and they just wonder every day who their little friends are going to be. And, you know, I'm thinking through all of these, you know, struggles that she's about to face going, gosh, what is the, what is the point of getting her a toy to play with? Let's get her something that would be meaningful, that would help set her on a great and positive path for the next season of her life. And we thought, what better way to do that than to get her connected to scripture, to the women of the Bible. We thought these women are, you know, heroes. We were, we were excited. And she, there's a woman named Hannah in the Bible. We thought, okay, I'll, I'll rewrite the story of Hannah and make it, you know, easy for her to understand. So we made her a little storybook and gave it to her for her birthday. And, you know, my husband and I were so excited. He illustrated the cover. It was like, you know, we had it bound to Kinko's, super official. And we give it to her and she, you know, hugs it tight and she smiled at me and she said, Auntie Erin, this is so special to me. I had no idea there was a Hannah in the Bible. And I think for me, that was our moment because we're looking at this little girl going, gosh, she and every other little girl we know can name every Disney princess and tell me all the details of their stories. And they are just enamored by these women. And we thought, could we create a similar connection to historical women who were used in a powerful way? I mean, these are real women. They are broken women, women who made mistakes, women who didn't have it all figured out, but they were able to be used powerfully in the world. And it's exciting to me to think about I mean, at the time it was so exciting and it still is to think about how we could connect a little girl to her heroes, because all of the research shows us that girls are powerfully impacted by their role models. If they can look and see and find themselves inside a role model, a positive woman, something inside them can wake up. And that is what excites me. And in becoming a parent, you know, my husband and I welcomed our first little girl four years ago. Oh. I think it just got so personal for me because I was, you know, I had the, the teacher aspect of, okay, let's, let's impact these girls in a positive way. But now I'm a parent of one and getting to come alongside her and champion this cause as the mother of a daughter and, and that we get to learn about these women together is so special. And it's such a blessing for our family. Uh, and I think what you're doing is so timely, right? Look what's in the headlines and the news, and there's uh, an uplifting of women happening. And you started this three years ago in a niche space. I mean, you're pioneering a space that didn't exist, which what I love about that is you're taking your unique, your unique gifts, your passions, and you're cultivating something and you're growing something that is new to the market. And it's giving young girls another... A set of mentors and models to follow and to aspire to in such a beautiful way. And it's such a gift. Um, so I love that so much. So Erin, we do know, so you, you've you had cancer come back four more times after that first story that you told us about. Can you take us back into um, how you're doing with your health now and how you managed to stay strong when it came, kept back, kept coming back? And was it the same ca- kind of cancer? Yes, it was the same kind of cancer. So I had metastasized aggressive variant thyroid cancer. It's a long name, um, but it's actually one of the better cancers to get if you're going to get one. But mine was so extensive that um, the prognosis wasn't excellent, like I said earlier. But um, having dealt with it the first time, did the treatment, all of that, and finished it, you know, got a clean bill of health. And then about nine months later, we started the process over again. It was back. 
And so that second time, I can't, it's, it's kind of a, a muddled, you know, mess of memories now, but um, right in the middle there somewhere, I met my now husband mm. and he was really instrumental in me feeling supported and loved and feeling hopeful in that season. I, I mean, I could have gone, oh my gosh, this is just, it's coming back. Like, and I could have sort of spiraled down, you know, as women do into all the negative, right. And like all the what ifs and all the, you know, what does this mean? And do I have a future? And I did that with him in the beginning of our dating relationship. Cause we dated through that second diagnosis and this guy, he just wouldn't leave me alone. He, I was trying to do, like I said, like with that first one, he was like, he was so matter of fact about it. He's like, no, no, I've been praying for, you know, a wife. I've been praying for a companion. I've been looking out into the world and just not really finding the person I'm supposed to be with. And when I met you, I knew it was you. And so we always joke that he comfortably stalked me at the beginning of our relationship because he, he was so persistent, but he, he showed me how, like he showed God's love to me, honestly, because he pursued me. He pursued me in a way that didn't really make sense. He pursued me in exactly the way I needed to be pursued and supported in that season of my life. And I'm so grateful for his example, because I had him with me, even through those next diagnosis when, I mean, my, my last one, I had to do my surgeries at the Mayo Clinic because my doctors at UCLA were like, we're not sure we can get the, this type of cancer out because of where it had spread inside my body. So I had to go, you know, somewhere else to do that treatment. He was right there with me. We stayed, you know, the week with my mom was there and just, he never left my side until I just finally submitted. Right. And went, okay, like what, what would this look like if I, if, if I entered into a partnership and a marriage and, you know, just saw, saw this thing through for where it would go. And it's, it's interesting because I mean, fast forward, my last diagnosis was 2012. We got married right in the middle of all the cancer stuff, 2010. So uh -huh. it's been six years wow. since any sort of cancer, anything. And it's, we think about it and it just feels like this distant memory because God almost violently shut the door on a really long season of sickness mm. and fear. Mm. And, you know, that was six years ago. And what God's done in the last six years in terms of giving us an idea for a business and we get to do this together, you know, we're a mighty husband and wife team. It's not like my husband works a different job. He quit his job before me to set up the infrastructure of all of our, all of the things we do business wise. So, wow. um, it's really beautiful to be able to do it together, to really embark on this challenge as a family and to watch what God's do or what God's done to bless us in terms of our own relationship, our now relationship with our daughter mm. and, and the interactions that we're having in the marketplace around this conversation of females and leadership and empowerment. It's so exciting to be able to do it with him. Wow. That's such a beautiful story. I, but just thinking and reflecting as you were talking, I mean, there may be people in the audience who aren't specifically religious or, you know, or maybe agnostic or the others that do believe in God or higher power, whatever they call it. But at the heart of it, what you're talking about is having faith and, and purpose and taking action on what's in your heart to do. I mean, I, I talk about in my book and just, you know, in conversation, when you have those voices inside, it's, you know, sometimes I call it like a whisper. So, oh, you know, take that class, uh, become a health coach, write that book, start a business. If you have these dreams that have been stirring in your heart and soul for a long time, whether or not you believe that's from God or a higher power or just something within you, it's important to follow that message. And that's really what this podcast is about. It's about listening to those voices. And I think Erin's story is a beautiful example of somebody who had a lot of faith and just listened to those whispers and took action. And I think what it becomes is an awakening, an opportunity for an awakening to say, you know what, this life is so precious and I am going to listen to those voices and I'm going to have courage and I'm going to move forward. I, I would totally agree with that. I think too. And I, I think back to that time very fondly and people probably think I'm crazy because I really do feel that those diagnoses and what I went through over that five year period was such an incredible blessing because of what happened to my heart and mm. my, 
my, the way I approached life and how I was going to live it was so inspired by that dark, hard time, but coming out of it and realizing what you just said, that life is precious and your soul and what's inside you wants to wake up and it wants to come out. And a lot of times, like as women, we listen to those whispers and we just, we either dismiss them or the voice telling us we can't do it is the louder voice. So we just shut down. But that's, that would be my challenge too. And just sort of to piggyback off of what you said is to listen to what your soul is telling you. And a really good practice is to write that stuff down. Because a lot of times as women, I mean, I know this happens for me, my thoughts just circle and they just swirl inside my head and just, you know, I'll think of things over and over and over. And if I can get them written down, they somehow make their way from my brain outside my body. And once they're on that paper, it's like they become more real. They become actionable. So I don't know. That's one thing that's really helped me in, in looking at, okay, what's, what's the plan? What's my purpose? What are the ideas inside me and how can they come out? Get them out get them out of your brain and then just start to take action on, on whatever you feel like your soul's telling you. Um, this is actually a perfect segue because I was just going to ask you to share with the audience three actionable tips that a mom out there who's had that voice whisper, who might have those negative voices that say, who do you think you are to start a business? Who do you think you are to write a book? Who do you think you are to want to have a voice in the world or whatever it is, or the fear that comes in, or I just don't have time or whatever, whatever excuse or impediment or block to that path might be, can you give us, so you've given us one, write it down, write down those ideas and those dreams just to make them more tangible. And there's actually research that proves that what you write down becomes real. So there's something very powerful about writing it down. So could you share with us two more actionable tips that moms can take? Yeah. And these two are related to each other. So the next one is find an ally. You need to find somebody who is a little bit ahead of you down whatever path you feel like you're being called down. So like for us, I mean, when we had the idea, we went, okay, where are the cool books that girls can read to learn about the women of the Bible, right? So I went to a bookstore. My husband and I went to the church bookstore and we started looking around and we were like super disappointed in what we found. It just wasn't what we were looking for. It seemed like lower, lower quality than everything else. That's like, you know, on mainstream with things like Disney and Pixar, right? So we're looking at it. We find one book and it's God's Promises for Little Girls by a woman named Amy Parker. And she lived in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And I thought, oh, this is such a cute book. It's like the closest thing we can find to what we're looking for. And my husband just goes, hey, why don't you email her? Let's email her. We'll, we'll ask her like five questions. We'll see. She's probably too busy. And in my head, I was like, we can't email her. You're crazy. But what ended up happening was one email that we sent to her created a lifelong friend, an ally, in what we're trying to do. I mean, I've had Amy Parker on my podcast. She has helped me edit every single book. She helped us write an initial book proposal. She just encouraged us to keep going when we got frustrated. I mean, the fruit that came out of that one, that one, you know, step in a direction of, okay, I'm going to be willing to reach out to one person that I think is a little bit further ahead of me and just ask some questions and find out, you know, what wisdom I can from somebody who's already done it. That, that I would say is a, a next great step from, okay, I have an idea to what do I do about it? Find an ally, find someone who can help you. Um, the third thing I would say, so write it down, find an ally. And then the third thing I would say just to help you on your way is to respectfully move the people who are negative about your idea away from you. It doesn't mean that you're not friendly with these people, but it does mean that you don't necessarily need to be friends with them. You need to maintain a healthy distance away from people who, whose lives swirl with negativity and all the can'ts and all the sad things in the world. And I mean, this world needs hope and encouragement and love and whatever value is in you to provide to the world, the world needs it. And anybody who's going to deter you from knowing that or from stepping into that is not somebody you need in your close intimate circle. So you can keep a healthy arm's length distance away from those people in terms of communicating and seeing what they have to put out. So I would just say like, get on the path of positivity and encourage yourself by putting people close to you that will lift you up and respectfully, you know, keeping at arm's length, the people who are going to drag you down. I think that's such great advice and I couldn't agree with you more on, on all of it. It's really so good. And, um, 
I've been doing the same actually in my life. I hired a business mentor to walk me through because he's, you know, a few steps ahead of me. And it's been so powerful because part of what happens when you do that too, it sort of sets, um, you're setting a clear intention and you're anchoring down like, you know what, I'm actually, I'm committed to this. I'm investing in myself and I'm going to move forward. And the last part that you said too is uh, absolutely, you need to surround yourself with positive people who want to see you rise and who you are helping rise as well. It's, it's such a beautiful um, three examples that you gave. So I'd love to switch gears now and go into some rapid fire questions, which just, you know, a uh, shorter answer, but, you know, really um, succinct in terms of how you feel about this. So the first is, how does Erin define success? How do you define success? Success is obedience to your calling and gosh, yes, that period. Success is obedience <laughs> to your calling, whatever that calling is. I love it. That's great. <laughs> Um, what resource, book, quote, person has most influenced your life? Oh, gosh. Okay. As a parent, I talk about this book all the time. It's called Are My Kids on Track? 12 Social, Emotional, and Spiritual Milestones That Your Child Needs to Hit. It's by a woman named Sissy Goff. I've read it three times. It's probably the most important parenting book out there on the market today. Um, the one I'm reading right now to understand the power of connecting and relationships as a business person is a book by Kevin Ferrazzi called Never Eat Alone. And it's a really good book. I feel like my husband wrote it because he's like a master networker. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that's a really it's good so one. Good. Um, so I do know that people out there, whether it's a man or a woman, um, who are moving forward in a very systematic way where there's so much progress happening. There's daily habits that are happening, whether that's a morning routine or an evening routine. And um, I imagine you have one. And if you do, I'd love it if you could share it with the audience. Oh, routine. I mean, yeah, like our routines pretty much don't change. What I will say is um, the power of the calendar is is unmatched. Um, if you calendar something, it will happen, at least in my experience. If you don't calendar it and you just talk about it, it doesn't happen. So we're sticklers to the calendar. We are masters of the calendar. Calendar. Our calendars are shared because we are in business together. Um, but our routine really consists of waking up in the morning and just giving that time to um, like our quiet time to, to spend time with the Lord and just be in tune with the, his wants and needs for the day. Um, my daughter's usually up about an hour after me. So we have breakfast together every morning, which is such a blessing and coming from teaching and having to leave before she woke up. I mean, that would just broke my heart. Um, when I would have to leave and not be able to be there for those sweet mornings, um, when she's little. So we get up, we have breakfast every morning. Um, she and I usually do a reading lesson for about 15 minutes and then we get ready on our own, um, at the same time. And we talk during that time and then she's off to our nanny so we can get started with work or calls or whatever we have. And then pickups usually the same. We come home, we make dinner together. We always eat together as a family. Um, and then we'll usually do some outing after, after dinner. So we'll go for a walk or we'll cruise down to the beach. And last night we went down and there was that, the bubble guy down in Encinitas, like blowing oh, massive yeah. bubbles for all the kids. And, uh, Rooney got to use the little sticks that he uses to, to have these massive bubbles. And it's kind of just a, you know, a little errand, um, like a family errand to do after dinner every day. But we really try to carve out time in our schedule for family because our first ministry is always this family way before our, our, kingdom calling, our marketplace calling, um, our, our first and most important business that we run is this family. That's great. Um, is there a story of inspiration? I mean, I would imagine with the work that you're doing, just somebody who came up that was either impacted by your book or just something that you wis witnessed that left you feeling happy and good that you can share with the audience. I just... I feel like the news spotlights all of the negativity in the world and not enough of the goodness of the people. And I really want to use this platform to remind people of the goodness. And they say that when you witness or even share a story of, of goodness, it helps like boost your endorphins and makes you feel better. So I'd love to spread some of that. Yeah, I, I think um, one surprising thing that's come out of this journey is the way that my personal speaking platform has just exploded. And I never expected to be 
you know, a traveling speaker and to be sharing with hundreds and sometimes thousands of people and teaching different things and talking about different things. But what I will say, um, I got some advice early on from Brent's, my husband, Brent, um, his aunt Pat, and she and I have cancer in common. She had ovarian cancer right around the same time I was dealing with all the cancer stuff. And I, we were talking, you know, about me getting invited to speak places. And I thought, and I asked her, gosh, what would it take for somebody like me who's so guarded, who's so, you know, scared of sharing her feelings to stand up in front of a group and like talk to them and deliver a a speech. Right. And she said something I will never forget. She said, you know, I don't know what it's going to take Aaron, but I do know that every time you say no to one of those opportunities, you are withholding a blessing from a person that needs it. And I gave a talk on mother's day at my home church here in San Diego And it was, you know, it was all about these games that I had played as a child and, um, you know, really struggled, you know, with insecurity and just comparing myself to girls and, you know, just what we struggle with as women. And I I gave the talk and uh, a young woman came up to me afterwards and she came running up to me (laughs) and I'm standing at the book table, you know, meeting people on signing the books for kids. And she stopped me and she looked right into my eyes and she said, that talk was for me. I, I, I don't come to church. I, I have, you know, I'm struggling in my faith. I don't, I don't really even know what I believe, but I know that that talk was for me. I know you were speaking right into my soul. And I thought, gosh, it makes it all worth it when you don't necessarily have it all figured out. Or if you make a mistake or if you're not sure and doubting yourself and whatever it is like that blessing you can extend to other people, even if it's not perfect is something that they need and want to receive. And you get to do that. You get to be part of, of what God's doing in that. And it's so, it's such a cool way to be, be blessed in your own journey when you just say yes to the places you're being called to. Mm, that's so beautiful. I love that so much. Uh, I actually could visualize sort of that whole interaction happening. And I think what it made me think about too is when you share your voice, your authentic voice, and you stay true to who you are and what you feel like you were meant to put out in the world, even if it impacts one other person, that's it, right? I mean, just literally knowing you've impacted one person can be enough to know that you've, it was worth just speaking what you spoke. So I I think that's such great advice that you gave and such a beautiful story. Um, I, I'd love to, if it's okay with you, because I do know so many women touched by cancer and you've, you've, you dealt with it five times, what advice could you give to a mom who feels like she has a gift to put out into the world, who's feeling scared, who's feeling so vulnerable, and, you know, the sense of wanting to stay present to what's happening to them and, you know, be realistic, but also to have faith? Like, what advice can you give them, baby, like some strength that you found or tools or whatever it was that helped you keep going. Could you, could you share that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the power of supportive friends and a network of people that can come around you is so, is of so of of paramount importance. I mean, it feels so isolating, I think is the word I would use when you're diagnosed, you just feel like you're alone in the world. No one understands. There's nobody that can even if, I mean, we know so many people that have dealt with either a diagnosis themselves or like someone very close to them. I think one out, one out of every two or three people is now personally diagnosed with cancer. So it's not like people can't understand or empathize with you, but it feels that way. So the more that you can, as uncomfortable as it might feel, put people in your way that can come alongside you, that can sit with you, that you will allow to love you in the way that we are all designed to love each other. It it really can create comfort. And what you need is peace. And the easiest way to get peace is to allow someone to help to to bring it to you. If you can't get it Mm. on your own volition or in your own heart with anything that you're doing personally, you've got to invite people into your space to bring peace to you. So that's what I would say, even though you feel isolated, just be around people and whether it's one other person or a group of people, and it's not to, you know, wash over the issue or to, you know, spend your time, you know, trying to not think about it. That's not what it is. It's just a healthy way to invite somebody in to go through it with you because we are not designed to struggle alone. And when we try to do that, 
it, it is detrimental to who we are as people and what God's trying to do in us. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. So that's so great and so helpful. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for everything that you've shared on the show today. For the people who would love to learn more about you and the work that you're doing, and you're beautifully, I didn't even get to mention this, but your books are so beautifully illustrated. When you mentioned Disney, like your books are like something out of Disney, which is so great for the girls that are reading it to see these beautiful images. Um, where can where can they learn more about you, Erin? Sure. So our website is BibleBells.com. It's B-I-B-L-E-B-E-L-L-E-S.com. My personal website is just ErinWeideman.com. It's where all my speaking stuff exists. You find out more about the books. And our podcast, which comes out twice a month, is called Heroes for Her, where we highlight positive role models for young girls. It's at heroesforher.com. You can find it on iTunes or SoundCloud or anywhere you can listen to podcasts. That's great. And I'll just end with just one other question, which is, is there anything that I didn't ask you today that you uh, wished I had so that you could share something that else that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah. The only other thing I would say, and we remind ourselves of this often, my husband and I, when we get stuck or when you know something doesn't go our way or we're not sure how to get ourselves over a hurdle that might exist or something that seems like an obstacle. We just use the phrase, keep going. And that was something that author friends said to us um, early on. And in many, many emails, when we'd ask her questions, we feel so frustrated about, oh, okay, book proposals and literary agents. And what does this mean? And starting your own company and everything felt like so much. And she just simply said all the time, she said, just keep going, just keep going, take that next little step, whatever it is, but keep mm-hmm. going and don't stop. And I feel like that advice has really sustained us and it's helped us grow our business and really put this out into the world in a way that's going to impact people. So just keep going. It's perfect. It's actually a perfect way to end the podcast. It's true. It's every little step you take each and every day that just that next right step for you that gets you on your way on your path. So that is a perfect way to sum it up. Um, Erin, thank you so much. I've loved this conversation and I love the work that you're doing in the world and I wish you the best on your journey. Thanks so much, Michelle. It was great to be here. It was such a pleasure. Thanks, Erin. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. I'd love to hear what resonated with you. So come on over to the goodlifecoach.com podcast page. While you're there, you can look at all the show notes from today's episode and join my newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive the first chapter of my book for free. Thanks so much for listening and bye for now.